Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the next episode of Life's Black Belts. As always, I'm your host, Eric Alders, and it's my honor and privilege to be joined by another Life's Black Belt. Today's Life's Black Belt guest is Lorraine Reguling. Uh, she's an author and English teacher who is now a freelance editor and entrepreneur. Her life journey is both motivational and inspirational. Lorraine's book, From Nope to Hope, is designed to help anyone who wishes to lead a happier life. It contains a built-in workbook, and it's also available on Amazon. And I had spent some time briefly talking with Lorraine prior to our recording today, and her story uh, definitely uh, perked up my attention, and she has had one journey that you're about to hear. So I will leave that for our interview. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Lorraine to the podcast. How are you, ma'am? Hi, I'm very good, Eric. Thanks for having me. Oh, it's my pleasure. So what I like to do uh, in these episodes, and as I was mentioning to you prior to, to hitting record, is uh, I feel like a lot of the world only gets to hear the stories of, of celebrities or famous people. And, and, and often it's difficult to relate to that because we all know that they have money and huge support teams. And, and it's very often in life that I've met so many amazing people that have accomplished and done so much, but they're the unknowns. And I love highlighting these stories and, and how it compares for, for me what I do, which is uh, teaching martial arts, and how the consistent grind through life, the perseverance, the overcoming of failures, the, the constant uh, push to become the best that we can be, how we develop our mindset and how we get into our careers or change careers help to shape us to who we are. And I think that those stories uh, are something that we could all relate to uh, on our human journey through life. So um, I know you have quite the story that I want to get to. So why don't we, uh, I like to start things off just kind of pre-framing a little bit of a background and just kind of paint the picture a little bit of maybe where you got your start, where you grew up and give me a little bit of the, uh, what was life like for you growing up? Okay. So growing up, I was the oldest of three children. My parents are still together, so our home life was fairly stable. Um, we never really wanted for anything. We always had, you know, food, food on our plates and a roof over our head. We didn't have a lot of extras. Um, we weren't poor, but we weren't really rich either. So um, as a teenager, I mean, at, well, from probably 10, 11, and 12, I started doing a lot of babysitting to earn money, you know, spending money. And um, in grade eight, I was valedictorian. Wow. So I've always had a fairly good head on my shoulders, and my parents had high hopes for me. That said, once I finished my first year of high school, a traumatic event occurred in my life and changed the course of my life forever. And that event was being raped when I was a 14 year old virgin. I'm by so a man sorry to hear that. More than just over twice my age. And yeah, so it completely devastated me. And this happened back in the mid 1980s during that era where things were kept hush hush nobody talked about anything people weren't aren't weren't as open as they are today and i didn't feel as though i could tell anybody about what happened to me and so i didn't i kept it all bottled up inside and i just tried to cope with the devastation, the awful feelings that I felt, um, you, you know, feelings of being dirty, feelings of guilt, like I thought maybe it was my fault, um, feelings of worthlessness and, you know, all of these negative things. And they caused me to fall into a, a deep depression. Um, the following year when I was 15, I, I even tried to kill myself. Mm. I mean, this is how badly that it affected me. And I, you know, I, I, I tried kind of coping on my own by, you know, turning to food for comfort or 
you know, I started smoking pot. Um, I started drinking a little bit, um, just trying to numb those feelings that I was having because I just didn't know what else to do. Yeah, you were self-medicating. Right. And this went on for uh, about eight years. And during those eight years, I mean, I, I ended up quitting high school because I, I, I just, I, I couldn't focus. I couldn't, my mind would not let me concentrate on anything. And so I started staying home and sleeping. I mean, that was another you know, thing that I used to try and escape feeling any of those feelings. And as a result, I missed a lot of school. I fell behind, so I just quit school. Um, you know, I, I, it was just hell. And then, you know, I'd go back every semester at the start and I'd try again. And the same thing would happen. And it was just a, a vicious cycle that repeated itself. Um, I started looking for love in all the wrong places, thinking, okay, well, if I give guys sex, maybe they'll love me. Maybe that's what love means. And that's how my twisted teenage brain thought. Mm. And at 16, I, I found myself pregnant and I had an abortion. At 17, I found myself pregnant again. And I ended up deciding to keep my child that time. Um, reason being, when I was 16 and had my first abortion, my mom had told me a story about my uncle who had this girlfriend who I thought they were going to get married. I loved her. I thought she was going to become my aunt. Well, they ended up splitting up. And I found out at that point uh, when my mom told me that they split up because um, she ended up having an abortion. Hmm. And apparently it was, apparently it was my uncle's doing. He wanted her to have it. Whatever happened, I don't really know. All I know is that she now cannot have children as a result. And she ended up marrying another guy. They really wanted children, but because of her abortion, she can't have children. And I thought, holy smokes, you know, here I am, 17, pregnant for the second time totally able to have a child and here's a woman who wants one so badly and can't have it and I thought you know I can't not have this child I have to do it because I've been given that chance that second chance that opportunity and so I I had my son when I was 18 and at that point you know I was I was pretty much grown up you know when you're a teenage mom you have to grow up quickly and so I, you know, I'd moved out of the house. I had my own apartment. I had been working. I saved money and, you know, got my own place and everything and took care of my son. And when he was seven months old, I ended up going back to school to a special program for single mothers at the adult education center in my city. And it took me four years to graduate, but by the time I was 22, I, I graduated with all of my high school credits and uh, got my diploma and entered, uh, applied for the program of my choice at university and got in. And I ended up, you know, with scholarships and awards and everything else, because like I said, you know, in grade eight, I was valedictorian. I was smart. Sure. I had a good head on my shoulders. And so even though I, you know, I had that to my advantage, um, I did get sidetracked for, you know, several years in, in because of what happened. To sure. If we could pause time. just if just for a moment, because you just, you know, you covered a lot right there in, in, mm -hmm. in a short period of time. Uh, I just want to rewind a little bit and go through some of that. Um, first, where where are you growing up? Where what city or town are you from? Oh, so Thunder Bay, Ontario is my hometown. Okay. It's where I am currently living. I, um, my family was Catholic, but we weren't really practicing Catholics. Um, I went to church with my grandmother, you know, Saturday or Sunday, usually once a week as kids. Um, but I was really the only one that went. And that was, that was just all part of, you know, like my grandparents lived next door to us. And when my mom um, started working at her store, 
it was my grandparents that basically, you know, made us dinner and everything. So they were a big part of my family because, you know, we were all basically in two houses, this, you know, the, the five of us and the two of them, my grandpa and grandma. So, uh, yeah, so that was kind of my, my childhood there. Um, right now. Yeah, it's okay. So now, now I know where you're from, but I wanted to, 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 you know, you said you had a really nice childhood. You did wonderful in school. Uh, not many significant moments are standing out before this uh, tragic event to you. You have a nice family upbringing. You say, you, you know, uh, you know, you guys aren't rich, but you're having a nice middle class life and, you know, mm-hmm. you're not needing for what, for anything. Right. How did this situation, uh, I don't need any details at all. The only curiosity I have is that, did you end up in a situation where you were around someone that you thought you could trust or were you attacked at random? No, I was, I was, um, I, when I, well, I had mentioned I had babysat for many people as a, right. you know, as a young teen. And um, one of my friends who I babysat for, she was a young single mother. And I would, she was just a few years older than me. I think I was like something like, you know, 14 and she was 19 or something. She was about five years older than me. And she introduced me to one of her male friends one evening when I was over there babysitting. She came home with him. Um, We sat around. I remember we smoked a joint together. We were all sitting talking, just enjoying each other's company um, before I went home. And he had given me his phone number and told me to call him sometime. Well, on the night that I was raped, I had a huge fight with my father and I decided to run away from home because he had grounded me to my room. It was about six o'clock in the evening. It was June. Um, I had one of my final exams at high school the next day and I, I was studying. And anyways, I don't know what happened, but he grounded me to my room and my younger brother and sister were outside playing somewhere. My mom was at work and it was just me and my dad that were home. And I felt that it was very unfair of him to ground me at my age. You know, I mean, I was 14, like I'm a responsible teenager. And so what I did is I jumped out my bedroom window and I took off and I didn't have a place to stay that night. Um, Initially, I was going to stay with uh, another friend of mine. They were having like a camping out in the tent in the backyard um so I went there but then the mother came out and caught us and so I had to leave so I didn't really have a place to go it was about 11 o'clock at night it was pitch black I didn't have any money I had enough to make a phone call so I called this guy that my babysitter of mine and like the one I babysat for introduced me to and he's like oh well it's kind of late I don't feel like driving come and just take a cab and I'll pay for it come and stay at my house tonight And I thought, okay, so I'll do that. And I did that. And I said, no, you know, let me, let me just crash out on the couch. There's a pillow and blanket. Just, that's fine. Oh no, no, sleep in my bed. He said, Mm -hmm. he was very insistent. And so I, you know, I was trying to sleep and he wouldn't let me. And then he just forced himself upon me. And I tried fighting him. I explained I was a virgin. I didn't, you know, it was hurting. I didn't, didn't want that. You know, it was like nothing I said mattered to him. It didn't click in his head of what he was doing. Like he just wanted it and that was right. that. And Horrible. yeah, it was. I mean, it was it was awful. Like I went into the bathroom afterwards and I was I was bleeding. I mean, it was my first time. There's, you know, blood coming out of me and everything else. And it wasn't my period. It was because of what he had done to me. Sure. And it was like it was it was just awful. So needless to say, I didn't really sleep that night. He drove me to my exam the next day and, and that, and, and that was that. And he didn't think anything was wrong. Um, meanwhile, my whole life had just been turned upside down and um, I ended up calling my mom after my exam and I told her cause I knew she was worried about me cause I mean, I had run away and see, I thought it was my fault because I was taught this was your punishment, did this you think? This was my punishment. Mm. God's watching you. He knows when you do something wrong, he's going to punish you. 
because of the Catholic upbringing, right? Right. You thought you deserved it in some sick way. Yep. I ran away from home. I did something wrong. That was what I did wrong. And this is how I'm being punished. And so I, yeah, I remember, I remember calling my mom and she's like, Lorraine, just come home, just come home. And I said, well, I said, I'm over at a friend's house. My friend lived right across from the high school and we met up after the exam. And I said, said, I don't really have a place to go. She's like, well, come on over. And she said, you can call your mom from my place. So I ended up, um, you know, and, and then I was worried about going home because, oh, I thought, oh my God, you know, I, I defied my father. I ran away from home. Like he's going to give me a beating, right? I mean, that was, you know, we were raised in the era where you got spankings or lickings or whatever you want to call them. Like your parents beat you when you did right. something wrong. Right. And so I thought, oh, you know, I don't I, I don't want to go through that. You know, I, I've just taken a big beating. I don't want to go through another one. You know, like so my mom assured me that if I came home, nothing like that would happen. She was just worried. She wanted to know I was safe, blah, blah, blah. Um, but yet I still didn't feel like I could tell her what happened. And I didn't I didn't really know like I didn't know how to process the whole event like it was so fresh and so horrible like I just right I was just you know in in such a bad mental place and and so I didn't say anything you know I went home and you know pretended like nothing was wrong and and life just went on and uh but being so I mean Again, you, you could obviously reflect back and think of how with, with your brain and knowledge today, how you could have handled it differently, but, you know, no, no friends, no best friends in your life that you were able to trust and confide in. You kept this all, all to yourself and it ends up leading to you doing horrible in school. I mean, from valedictorian to dropping out of school, were exactly. there, what, what were the... Um, you know, the, the people in your life are from parents to teachers to guidance counselors, you know, the mentors in your life, the, the adults in your life, what were they thinking was going on with you that you turned such a 180 without knowing? They, what, they, what didn't, they didn't know and they didn't really say anything. Um, none of, in high school, I wasn't really close to any of my teachers. Um, I remember in grade 10 when I, in my Christian living class, because I went to a Catholic high school, there was one teacher, I was having a really bad morning one morning, and it was my first class of the day. And I remember walking out at the end of the class and him saying, hey, Lorraine. And I turned around and looked, he's like, are you okay? And, and I, I thought, you know, he, he sees something. Like, I don't know what he sees, but he sees something. Mm. And I just looked at him and I said, yeah, I'm fine. And I kept going. But I never forgot that. And, you know, it's interesting because last year I actually, he's retired now, retired teacher. I I called him up and I said, you know, I said, I never forgot you you saying those words to me. Just, it stuck in my head. and And I just wanted to thank you for caring. And I told him I ended up writing my book and I told him everything that happened to me. And, and he was really touched. And he said, you know, Larry, you should get into the high school and you should talk to these students about, you know, about what you went through and about how, you know, you wrote this book and everything else. And I said, yeah, I said, you know, I said, that's actually something I'd like to do. And so he put me in touch with somebody to contact, but I still haven't reached out and I'm not quite sure why. <laughs> well, I, don't uh, you know. I don't want to revisit yeah, thing. it's it's difficult because you you talk it, about it, but I, I talk think, about it on podcasts all the time. But you know, yeah, but you're, you're, there's a microphone right? and there's a computer, so it's a little bit less personal than just, just my guess. Because obviously, yeah. I teaching martial arts, I, I I've done lots of women's self defense classes and have had many women sit down and share their stories with me. Uh, but I could imagine when you would have to look out into the eyes of young girls that that are 13 14 16 or whatever may be you would potentially see yourself in them and and that creates a reality potential that 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 obviously could be a bit overwhelming so that's something you'd you'd have to come to in your own time would your story be able to benefit them you know i believe that but you'd have to reach a point i believe where you feel strong enough to to handle that and and make yourself so vulnerable in, in front of people um staring back at you and 
you know, when you, if you find that that's something that you want to do, then I think you'll get there in, in your own time. But I think I will eventually. I just, um, yeah, I, and I think you're right because I'm a very emotional type of a person. Um, when I am in front of a group of people, being a, you know, I ended up becoming a teacher as well. So I can understand, you know, about being up in front of a group of people and having the strength and the courage to just stand there and speak. Like not everybody can do that. Mm -hmm. And public speaking is something that I, I actually enjoy. However, when it's about such a sensitive topic, like I know even when I've read some of my poetry to other people, you know, it brings tears to my eyes because mm -hmm. of, you know, the things that I've gone through because of sure. the subject matter and things like that. So I think that part of it could be my fear of breaking down and becoming a blubbering mess in front of people. It's okay, though. I mean, I'll, to, and, and to, no, to, re, to relate, and I'm just not uh, diminishing or comparing what you went through at all, but in the role that I play here as the head master instructor, I obviously have a, a look to the students that comes across very strong and powerful. And there's been many times that we've done charities or have had different events, and I've teared up and cried in front of people. And in the back of my head, I'm like, oh, man, they're going to – you know, here I am, you know, this big tough guy crying in front of everyone. And then I would start to have parents come up to me afterwards and they thanked me. And I'm like, what are you thanking me for? I'm sorry. Like I lost it in front of everyone. And they're like, no, like I wanted you to, to know that we're very thankful that you could be such a strong man, but also be strong enough to show your emotions to everyone, to show our daughters, and to show our sons that you could be both. You could be tough and you could be sensitive all at the same time. So from a, from a male standpoint, it's not something that's as common as as accepted, uh, at least in a guy's mind, that that it, we received well. Um, so I'm just letting you know that, yes, you may break down and yes, you may be sad. Um, however, it may also be a part of, of your continued healing process to, to be able to allow yourself to be open and vulnerable, go through your moments. I don't believe anyone hearing your story would be shocked or upset to, to, to see you break down and to cry a little bit. And I believe when you're in front of a group of people, and again, different type of teacher, but, but, but teaching for 20 some odd years, it's not just saying words to people. Anyone can get up and, and read and say things, but to connect with someone, um, one of the best ways to do that is, is emotionally. And they may hear people speak. They may hear your words. But I believe the emotions that are so raw and real with you, if they heard that and saw that, I believe it would stop their, their mind from processing all the things that are going on and really zone into what you have to say. And I believe you would really be able to connect with them. You know, again, when you have that time or strength to do it, I, I wouldn't view that at all, just in my opinion, as a sign of weakness from you at all, but a, a sign of strength that you're willing to, you know, you might be feeling that, but I believe what they'd be perceiving would be nothing but your absolute strength. I, I do understand what you're talking about because I have actually um, in a small group of people when I was giving a presentation to these women entrepreneurs at Paro Women's Center, I ended up bringing up a little bit about what happened in my past. And, and it, was, it was really funny because, you know, like as a teacher, you're trained to watch reactions. And I immediately, you know, everybody looked up and I had their attention, like mm -hmm. undivided attention. They weren't looking at their notebooks. They weren't looking at their laptop. They were like hanging on to my every word. Absolutely. Just and I was like, and then, you know, I said, I'm, I, you know, I'm sorry. I Cause I did end up getting, you know, teary and emotional and they're like, Lorraine, it's okay. Like, Absolutely. That's what, and, 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 you know, and it's funny because when I had this teacher in university in my Canadian poetry course, she used to recite certain poems and she'd get all emotional too. And I thought, you know, that's awesome. That's that she did that, you know, mm -hmm. it's like, she, she is that caring and compassionate and, and that into it that she connected with it touches it yeah. touches her that much that you know it brings tears to her eyes and you know it's I mean the same thing with me like I'll be watching you know certain shows or something you know movies whatever and I'll just like start crying out of the blue because mm -hmm. I've, I'm just so moved and so I understand that that's you know that is something that does connect us so I I, I don't know if that's what my fear really is or if it's a, a, some kind of something else that's holding me back from actually reaching out. Like, I, I, I don't really know what it is because, you know, I'm a very confident person nowadays. Like my mindset is 
where I think it's supposed to be. You know, I consider myself a successful person. I have, you know, I, I don't, not necessarily, like I'm not talking like millions of dollars successful. I'm talking successful in the sense of where I used to be and where I am now mm -hmm. and how much I've grown on my personal journey. And it's, you know, I mean, I used to be someone who was depressed all of the time. I used to have suicidal thoughts all of the time. I, I was a real wreck. Like I went from being an emotional mess to a success in my mind. Um, but that took a lot of years of work. And I, you know, like I said, for those eight years after I was raped, I didn't get any kind of counseling. I didn't tell anybody. It was after I had gone back to school that my teacher at the adult education center, um, her name was Pat. She, she one day took me aside and said, Lorraine, what's going on with you? Like something happened to you and I want to know what it is. And we talked and we talked and, and I said, yes, you know, yes, I was sexually abused. Like I was raped and this is what happened. And she knew because she was trained as, oh, she used to be a counselor and in her second career, she became a teacher. And so she saw in me with the same thing, I guess, what that one high school teacher who reached out to me mm -hmm. that day saw. Like so was it you, th you looking back on this, wrong. is that you looking back on this, is this something that you just you weren't ready to confess on your own. You almost needed somebody to, to call it out on you and, and say, hey, I see that you need to talk. I see something's wrong with you. You almost wanted someone to know the thoughts and emotions that were in your head, even though you wouldn't share them. But like, yeah, I'm curious, it's like you didn't share this with close friends. You didn't share this with family. You, you, you wait eight years. You're in front of a professor that you don't know that great. Did you, yeah, and, were and you surprised that you actually opened your mouth and finally told somebody? Were you surprised it was coming out of you? Yeah, I was. I was actually, I was more surprised that she knew. I was like, how the hell did she know something was wrong? Like, how did she know something was wrong with me? And at her urging, I mean, she's, you know, when she told me that she used to be a counselor, I said, well, why don't you just counsel me? And she says, no, because I'm your teacher and I can't do both. So she says, you have to go and get this counseling from a specific, another person, a specific counselor who is working, currently working, doing that. And so I, I did, I went to my doctors, I got a referral, told him, you know, told him what I had been through and he was really surprised. And so he got, he gave me a referral. I went to go see the psychologist and I started working with her, um, very frequently actually and we she urged me to buy these books called the courage to heal and i still have those books it's a it's a big thick it's like an inch thick book and it come there's an accompanying workbook so what you do is you read through the chapter and it talks about all these different people and all these different situations, what they go through. And then the workbook asks you questions, you know, do you identify with so-and-so or what do you identify with? And, and, you know, have you ever felt this way? And it's all, it puts you in touch more with your feelings and your experience and it, and it helps you analyze things. And so I really loved working through those books. And then with, you know, each time I met with my counselor, we would discuss the topics that I had, you know, the chapter, the topic of the chapter that I had just done and worked through it. And we'd, we'd talk things through and she'd help me see things in a new light. And so it was, you know, that kind of therapy worked really, really well for me. Um, and, you know, I ended up going through five years of university and becoming a high school math and English teacher. And I moved away to do that um, to a small town. And one day, one of my students came up to me and told me she, she needed to talk to somebody and she didn't know who to talk to. And, and she said she thought maybe she could talk to me because of some of the things that I had shared about my, you know, my life in, with, with the classroom. And, and I, so we took, you know, we had a private meeting and we, she told me that she was being abused 
sexually by her cousin. Mm. And I still had those Courage to Heal books with me. And I, I still have them to this day. I mean, they're, they're a part of my life. And so I, what I did is I took, um, I, I photocopied some of this stuff for her. And I talked with her and I, you know, I, I, I urged her to get counseling as well. And, but in the meantime, until she was actually, you know, could get the counseling, this is what we started doing together. So I, I was really glad that she felt comfortable enough to come to me because I, at that age, didn't feel comfortable enough to go to anybody. And so, you know, when you're a teacher, they say as long as you can help one student, you've mm -hmm. made a difference. Mm -hmm. 100%. She was one of those students that I helped. Right. And I hope that, uh, you know, if she's listening to this or even if not, I just hope that, uh, you know, she's okay and she got the counseling that she needed and that she had the strength to keep fighting. Right. And I imagine, Lorraine, that that story would be magnified by a countless amount of women and girls that may need you to be their are you okay person the the people that stood out to you to the people that asked the questions and again not that this has to be your mission in life but um you know you obviously have had these experiences and gotten through them and you see the impact that it had on you by not sharing it for such a long period of time and how how wonderful it must feel to be able to have been there for someone to feel comfortable enough to share with you something so personal and and tragic that it's very possible that you could be that person for for many people and you know it, i can't imagine that being an easy thing at all or to to you know i'm sure there's parts we'd want to sit back and be like hey i didn't ask for this i didn't ask to be the the mentor uh, of people that have suffered abuse is not the ticket that i that i requested but you know, unfortunately, we don't always get to accept uh, and choose the cards that were dealt. And but you've, no, you're, you've, you're, you've you're, learned you're, to you've learned to overcome, and you've learned to use these experiences to make you stronger. And I think that through helping empower these other girls, it'll only continue to strengthen things. And often, when we have these fears and these doubts, like you do about sharing your story. Um, I know I gave you some opinions on it already. And again, I'm not a psychoanalyst or anything like that. I've just been teaching for a long time and I've, I've had lots of conversations with lots of people on, on a lot of these topics. You're older now, you have a, you have a child, but when, when you discuss this, uh, there's the 14 year old girl inside of you that's, that's re-experiencing it. And, and, and that's, she has to merge a little bit and know that she survived it and maybe maybe not fully yet have you have you merged the two to let her know that you're okay and maybe through this process of sharing the story with others you know those those two parts from your past and present can come together finally and and find some peace in it yeah you know they always um they say you know right like what would you say to your younger self you know write your younger self a letter and you know things like that and i've always I've always had a hard time kind of like, you're right. I need to merge those two pieces of myself together. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you're also right about finding, you know, sometimes like life throws things your way and you don't necessarily know why. And it will eventually become apparent and still you're like unprepared like you weren't you, that's not how you thought your life was going to be mm -hmm. um like when i started blogging and i wrote about my um suicide attempt and i wrote about you know everything that i was going through and why i did it and everything um i started i i then also offered you know tips of what people can do if they're feeling that way well that article that true story of mine ended up hitting like the number one page in Google. And I was getting over like 500 people a day at one point reading that. 
every single day. And that's what prompted me to write my book. Because I thought, holy shit, you know, there's so many people out there that are going through crap that they don't know how to deal with, that were feeling exactly like I was. I need to help these people. Because I got through it by the grace of, you know, these people in my life that saw something, something was wrong with me. I had those people there to, you know, to see that and help me push me towards the healing process. And all of these people out there who are, you know, stuck, they don't have that. And so maybe I need to be that person, like you said, you know, they're, mm-hmm. They, they found me through that. So I thought, I have to write this book and I have to share because there's so much more than I could just, you know, put in a, a, you know, an online article of, you know, like whatever, 2,000 or 5,000 or whatever words. You know, I, I got a whole book in me. And so I just, I just wanted to show you, like, my book is, you know, it's pretty close to it, you know, an inch wow. thick. Like, it's, I mean, here's my finger, right? So you can see. Solid. You can see how, and, you know, and I mean, at the end of each chapter, like I ask questions of the reader and I give them a little spot as well to, you know, a couple of pages just to, to right. write in, write in, you know, reinforce the, what I'm kind of trying to teach them in each chapter, the different strategies and techniques that I use to, you know, to stay strong and to stay happier and, and on, you know, on a daily basis. And, you know, a lot of the techniques, like even one of the techniques I never even learned in counseling. I actually learned that after I became a blogger online and just came across, came across them. And that's the positive affirmations. Um, and I've talked about this lots in, in the past about, you know, on, on other podcasts that I've been on and I've talked, I've talked to, you know, I always say, this is my, this is my secret to success kind of thing. My secret to happiness um, because positive affirmations uh, have first of all they work really quickly and like you know you, if you use them every day for like a week you'll start seeing results and that's probably the fastest working technique that I have ever come across and I mean in this day and age we want we want results now like instant sure. instant gratification that's the kind of society we're living in now like we don't want to wait three months we don't want to wait till next year we want we don't even want to wait till like you know, next month we want to, or next week, like we want it now. And, and these things, they really work. And, you know, when you start using them every single day, just reciting, you know, a few things over and over or reading them over and over, you start seeing changes in your thought processes fast. And, and that's one of the things I really liked about them because for so many years I struggled, you know, I'd wake up and I'd be like, uh, you know, another day of hell. Like, and that was my, that was my mindset. It was like, I didn't even want to live. I didn't want to go through this pain anymore. And now, you know, I wake up and it's like, yeah, oh, I, I'm still tired. I want to go back to sleep. But as soon as I have my tea and I sit down and I, you know, have my list of positive affirmations and I go through them, it's like, yes. Five minutes later, my mind is set right. I'm good for the day. I can go and I can go accomplish things. I can go and meet my goals. And I am strong and powerful and passionate and, and just loving life. Like for the first time ever, you know, like these last five years since I started my business have been the best five years of my life. Honest to God. Um, so let's talk about that a little more. We, we talked about you transitioning, uh, getting your degree, becoming a teacher. Okay. So mm-hmm. let's, let's bridge the gap a little bit to, you know, raising your son and bridging the gap from that to starting your own business and, and kind of connect those dots a little. Okay. So I had, I had mentioned that I had moved away to teach high school math and English. Um, so I had to move to a little town to do that. And I wasn't really comfortable living there because I'm from I wouldn't say a big city but I mean a a city of about 120,000 people so I mean a a good size city and I moved to this little town of 9,000 people where everybody basically knew everybody else and there's you know all these little cliques and everything else and I just didn't fit in and even though I tried and then I ended up quitting my job and moving back to Thunder Bay And once I did that, 
um, oh, there's a whole part that we're missing too. Okay, sure. It's it's, it's the whole prostitution thing that oh I got boy. involved with. Oh yeah. Okay. Oh, oh, my story gets worse before it gets better. All right. So um, I had mentioned when I was a teenager that I, you know, started looking for love in all the wrong places and thinking, oh, if I give guys sex, they'll love me. And I, you know, I quickly realized that wasn't the case. And then one day I got an offer. Um, I was hitchhiking downtown to go see one of my friends and a guy picked me up and he, when he found out where I was going, um, he associated that, well, that was an area where the cookers were, you know, known to congregate. And so uh, he thought I was a hooker. And so he asked me if I would, you know, do something for a certain amount of money. And I said, you know what, why not? And it took me like five minutes. I was 80 bucks richer. And I was like, you know what? Yeah, maybe I should do this. So that was how I got involved with prostitution. And um, that's what I started doing to make extra money on the side. And after I quit teaching, I came back to Thunder Bay. And that's what I ended up doing to uh, supplement my income was was prostitution. So wait, this is so the prostitution began prior prior to having your son. Uh, no, after. After, after having your son, yeah, after, but having after son. but but before becoming I think a teacher. I was, yeah, but before becoming a teacher, I think I was around twenty. I think my son was probably about two. I was either twenty or twenty-one when it happened because I remember when I was twenty-one, this one guy. Um, used to like cruise around the streets and look at me and one day he stopped me and when I got in his car I looked at him and I saw how young he was he was only 19 I was 21 and I looked at him and my first words were uh, you're too young to be doing this shit what are you doing like picking up girls like what are you doing and I started giving him shit right and he just started laughing and he says well I don't actually want to pick you up I just want to talk to you and we ended up talking and talking and well, we ended up going out for two years. So wow. he, uh, yeah, so he became my, my, my boyfriend for a couple of years. And, um, he told me, he's like, okay, Lorraine, you either, you know, choose me or you choose the streets. What do you, what do you want? And I'm like, well, I choose you. And so I, I, you know, I got off the streets and he, because I wanted a relationship, you know, obviously. And so I was, at that point, um, still in, still finishing my high school credits. So yeah, so I was about like 21 years old at the time and close to being done graduating from the, the adult education center. Um, and then after I moved away, well, we went out for two years and we split up and then I moved away. I had, I was with a different guy at that point and um, we ended up uh, we were living together for two years as well and then I moved away to get my teaching job we tried making our relationship work but long distance relationships don't always work and so we ended up splitting up I stayed down in Fort Francis for three and a half years teaching and then I moved back to Thunder Bay and I you know fell back into my old habits of you know making money quickly and easily and uh to get out of that um that's a whole different story that's where my son comes in because okay. my son found out what i was doing well i, well, I want to pick that up but i, I just want to say it must have been very difficult for you to accept what you fell back into after achieving so much, becoming a teacher, even helping the young lady that you mentioned that got you so emotional after what she went through and hearing her story and reeling, realizing the impact you could have and how educated you were to just fall back to what you could do too quickly and to accept that you were back on the streets again. That must have been, that must have been a really hard time for you to go through. Um, it was, uh, see, for me, after I was raped, my whole mind uh, got twisted. My way of thinking got twisted. And for me, I never equated, like, like I had mentioned that I, you know, I thought, well, you know, 
sex and love are the same thing. And I, I know that's not right now. I know that, but at the time I thought, okay, well, maybe if I do this, then, you know, I'll feel better or this will happen, blah, blah, blah. And so my, my views towards sex have never been the same. And so it never meant anything to me. It was just an act. It became an, it, it became, you know, like doing the dishes is just a task you have to do or, you know, doing your, you know, doing your books or doing, you know, accounting, whatever kind of chore it is. Like that's what it became to me. It was just like completely unemotional, unemotional, very detached. Like this is work. I get paid to do this. That's all it is. Right. Like, you know, it, it, it meant nothing to me. And so I think that's how come I was able to easily just be like, to just brush it off. Like, it's not a big deal to me. You know, like I get paid to do this. It's not, so what? You know, I'm, I'm not affected by it. I'm not, but I was, that's the thing is, is, is I really was because I ended up, you know, I would talk to people and they would, they would say things to me and like, Lorraine, you're so, you know, you're so much better than that. You don't need to degrade yourself. You don't need to do that. You should be doing something else with your life. Like you're a smart person, you know, you're, you're meant for better. And, you know, in the back of my mind, I'm like, yes, I agree with you. But, you know, it's when you have addictions, like I have a very addictive personality. And at the time I was also, you know, I I got into drugs and I, I got, you know, further and further. And after my son found out about what happened, what I was going through and what I was doing. I mean, he decided to move out. Uh, he was 19 at the time and he decided to disown me, never have anything to do with me ever again. Mm. And I was in shock. I was like, how could he do that? But I mean, he had his own stuff. He was, you know, he was trying to, make something of himself and I was not being a very good mother and giving him the supportive home life that he needed so that's what he felt he needed to do and you know so he went his way I ended up spiraling downward even further I I started smoking crack that's how bad things got. So for those first 10 months after he moved out, my, I, that, I hit rock bottom. That was my rock bottom. And I was like, oh my God, what the hell? Like my life has completely fallen apart. And so I, all my money, all my money went to this drug. I didn't pay... Uh, my rent. I didn't pay my my phone or cable bill. They got cut off. Like I was consumed by this drug. My whole life was literally consumed by this drug. And I remember one day I wanted to watch TV and I couldn't. And this is before like I had the internet or anything. Like I didn't even have a computer back then. I wanted to watch TV and I couldn't and because, you know, my TV had been cut off. So I called up my mom and I'm like, mom, can I come over? I just want to watch TV for a bit. And I had told her um, that I was smoking crack and she knew I was into this, these drugs and stuff. And I, I was, you know, at least by that point I was comfortable enough. I pretty much told my mom everything. And so I uh, went over to her place, um, no drugs, no nothing, just me. And I stayed there and I ended up spending the night and I thought, you know, this is really nice nice not to have to you know be out on the street be doing drugs be you know like this is a a totally like separate from the life that I was living and so I really enjoyed that and I started spending more and more time over at her place and which means less time off the street and away from the drugs and everything else and so that's how I ended up getting out of that situation and out of that lifestyle because I had my mom and my dad there to to just give me what I needed at that point and so um that was the kind of uh point in my life where it was you know okay this is you know this I need to I need to get my shit together like I need to you know smarten up and get away from all this crap so 
so that I can eventually like get my son back in my life. And that's what I started doing. So I got off the drugs, I got off the streets, I started making better choices. And then ironically, as I was getting healthier, my appendix burst. Mm. So I end up in the hospital thinking like literally dying because I mean my appendix like they had to do major surgery they had to cut me open they, usually they do the laparoscopy not me they had to cut me right open dig all these pieces like it went everywhere and I was in so much pain like I felt like that was like it was worse than giving giving birth to my child like the amount of pain I was in I knew I was dying like it was awful and the funny thing is is all I could think of is I can't die because I didn't say goodbye to my son. And I don't want to die because I have so much to live for. And I don't want to die because I have to achieve my dreams. And these are the thoughts that went through my head. So that was my like, my aha moment in my life. That's when I had my epiphany. After I got out of the hospital, I ended up writing a letter to my son. I found out where he was working. I didn't have any other way of contacting him. So I write him this letter. Apparently he reads it and th or doesn't even read it. He just throws it away. But I end up phoning his work after about a month of, you know, not hearing a reply. I phone his work. I find out when he's working and I talk to him. Julian, I've been through this, you know, I'm, I'm better now. I almost died. I'm okay. I didn't die. Uh, they saved my life. Here I am. I'm clean. I'm sober. I'm off the streets. I'm, you know, trying to make changes with my life. And uh, he, because he's my son and he knows me so well, he knew that I wasn't bullshitting him. Right. He knew I was telling the truth. He heard it in my voice and he gave me another chance. Uh -huh. And so we reconnected and we started rebuilding our relationship. This was in October, November, and December of January 20 of 2012. And in January 2013, um, because of something he said to me just before Christmas, I asked him what he wanted for Christmas that year. And uh, he says, Mom, I don't want anything. He says, I just take that money and spend something on something you really need. And that's how, that's how selfless of a son I raised. Like, that's how awesome he is. And I, I mean, I still got him Christmas presents, but I, I listened to what he said and I thought, you know what? I should buy something for myself, something to invest in myself. So I bought this book called The Writer's Market because I'd always wanted to be an author and to, you know, do something in the writing field. That was, I've always loved words. I've been write, reading and writing since like, you know, age four, five, six. I remember in grade one, I was writing cursive within one line when everyone else was learning to print within two. And I mean, writing was my passion. And I thought, you know, you're right. I got to do something. I, I've always talked about it. I've never done it. I've got to start taking steps to do it. And so that's what I did. I bought, I bought a laptop. I bought this book who, you know, it said, well, authors are now expected to promote their own stuff on social media and have a blog and you know, this and that. And I'm like, well, I need a laptop to do all this. So I bought a laptop. I started blogging four days later after doing some research, what's blogging and everything else. I started blogging and I just kept going and going and going. I started out on a free platform. A year later, I turned, I, I transferred everything to my own site. And that's when my business was born, Wording Well. So Wording Well was born in February, 2014. And I have been, you know, now it's been over five years since I've been running my business. At first, I, I, didn't, I didn't really know what I, you know, what I was setting out to do other than to try and make a name for myself as a writer, as an author. And I ended up, you know, publishing a couple of, well, my first book is a book of short stories. And I learned that you can self-publish you don't have to be published by this, you know, by one of the big traditional publishing companies. So I learned about self-publishing. And once I self-published my first book, actually, even before it happened, I had been talking about it. And I have a, uh, one of my friends said, oh, well, I want you to help me with my book. And I want you to help me publish my book. And I'm like, okay. So I had already offered freelance writing services 
with my business. I offered freelance editing services. Then after doing this and helping him, I started offering author assistant services. So out of these experiences, you know, I built my business and it was really cool because it's like, wow, you know, I'm getting paid to do something I love. I mean, what better um, outcome could I have possibly asked for? You know, they always say like, if you do something you love, you never have to work a day in your life. Right. And that's exactly how I feel as cheesy as it sounds. I mean, that's it. I do what I love doing and I'm getting paid for it now. So that's how I now, you know, make, make my living. And it's really cool because I get to help so many other people with their books and I get to help people achieve their dreams. And, but getting back to what you had said earlier about, you know, we find ourselves thrust in this position that we never thought possible. And that's how my second book came about, you know, from my suicide story, I decided to write a book to help more people. And all of a sudden, you know, here I am, I'm kind of thrust into this um, position of helping other people in this way that I never set out to do that, you know? And so I, I just welcomed it, obviously, you know, I mean, I, cause I love helping other people. Um, it really hit home for me and I'm just going to end here because it really hit home for me when I was asked to share my story in a blog post on someone else's site. The title of that is rape, drugs and prostitution. One blogger's journey to success. And I was terrified of sharing that with everybody. But I thought I have to do it because number one, this way it'll avoid any kind of scandal, you know, like people like, oh, did you know so-and-so was a prostitute or, oh, did you know so-and-so was a drug addict? Like, how can we trust her now? I was worried about all those things. I was worried about all the stereotypes. I was worried about all the negativity and flack that I might receive as a result. But at the same time, I also thought, you know what? I'd rather people hear it from me straight out of the horse's mouth rather than people talk about it behind my back. Right. And so that's why I did it. Even though I was completely terrified, oh my God, people are going to judge me, this and that. And you know what? Really, the really funny thing happened, Eric? People responded favorably. They're like, Lorraine, you're so courageous. You're so brave. You're such an inspiration. Like, look at all this crap you went through and now look at you now. Mm -hmm. And I was like completely bored because I didn't expect to be so embraced by other people and to get such positive feedback. Like, and that's where it goes to show you that your mind can completely suck you into thinking all of the wrong things. And that's why changing your mindset is so important because other people will not, they don't think like you, you know, they, they, they see the good in you that, you know, like people out there, they're listening to me right now thinking the exact same thing. Like, Holy crap, this woman has been through hell and back again. How many times over? And yet look at her now. She's got a business. She's got friends. She's got online support. She sounds like she's doing really well for herself. She sounds pretty happy. She's got her shit together. If she can do it, so can I. Exactly. And that's exactly my message. If I can do it, oh my God, so can you. Right. Well, that's the reason I love having these interviews because we often think what we're going through, we're the only ones, you know, no one can know what we're going through. It's just me. It's my story. No one will relate. And that was you at a younger age. No one would, no one would get you. You couldn't share it. You'd be judged. You'd be ridiculed. And what you've been learning is that people love to hear, you know, that story of someone coming up from the ashes and, and, and persevering because we've all been down and out. We've all had these different moments, maybe not to the extremes that your life's journey took you on, but we have plenty of moments where we think we'll accomplish or be nothing. And, and by not giving up, by, by, you know, not following that suicide route, by reaching out for help, 
by sharing your story, you could, you could climb yourself out of some really, really deep down dark places and really change your life. The only one that's going to do it is you, you know, you could always wait for the, the, the knight in shining armor to come in and rescue you. But I think the moment you had to reach at your rock bottom or anyone does is that, you know, yes, you could have a good support system, but ultimately everything has to happen from within. You have to want to make the change and it's not easy and it's going to be hard and it might sound impossible, but you got to wake up every freaking day. Like you said, do what you got to do and, and make some strides in the right direction. So, it, I mean, it's, it's, it's all the reason why, you know, you're a life's black belt. That's, it's not like, when I explain to somebody, when they say black belt, oh, you, you know all of the stuff and you're, you could beat up everybody. And it's like, no, actually what black belt is, is just becoming a white belt all over again. All, all it really has done is given you a foundation. You've, you, it, you've, you've shown up, you've persevered, you've gone through all these obstacles and challenges and you've reached a certain level when you're finally up there and you think this will be the end all be all. You get to that level and you go, man, I don't know anything. This is a lifelong ongoing study there's mm -hmm. there's no perfection there's no end line there's no i'm done it's consistent it's constant and you know life's gonna keep coming over and smacking you in the face multiple times but as you continue to strengthen your mind and your and your heart in yourself a little bit you have the ability to to, to navigate these things much better because you can reflect on how many times you've done it already and go all right well this sucks but i've been here how many times over there's just going to be one more thing i'm going to get through and i'm going to come out on the other side uh, what's my lesson going to be? I can't wait to see what I'm going to, you know, some people like, what was me? Another great way of looking at it is going, what's my lesson going to be at the end of all this? What am I going to learn? How much stronger and better of a person am I going to be at the end of this? And it's, again, some of the questions we have or the mindset, the thoughts that we have that guide us one way or the other. So mm -hmm. in, inside your book, uh, Nope to Hope, what are some of the, uh, as we get towards the end here, what are some of the messages there that you could push out to someone if they're in a similar type of a situation that you'd like them to know that they could find uh, by picking up a copy of your book? Well, my book shares uh, strategies and techniques that you can use to overcome basically any kind of negative feelings that you're having in your life, whether it's, you know, as, as something like depression or, you know, even to the point of having suicidal thoughts, like it could be anywhere on that spectrum, like you could just be, you know, you can still be a happy person even and still use these techniques to become even happier. So really, this book is for everybody. And the, some of the, the, the strategies and techniques I use, um, I, st I still use them, actually. So this is kind of like, you know, my Bible of, of what I, what I do on a, you know, like on a daily basis, like maybe not every day, but like, it's still a part of my life. And I actually made two chapters free on my website. One of them is about the positive affirmations and it's called how to use positive affirmations to improve your life. The second one is use meditation, the law of attraction, and visualization to be more successful. So those two, uh, there are two actual chapters from my book. They're on my Wording Well website. Um, if Could um, you give that? I mean, I'll put this into the show notes as well. Yeah, but why can, don't I we go through that? Link, yeah, I can oh, give yeah, you the link. Yeah, for sure. To these three chapters. So what is, what is your, your website for everybody? Wordingwell.com. Okay. It's and would exactly that be a great, a, a good hub? Well. Would that be a good hub to find access to not only your book, but maybe if people wanted to follow you on social media as well? They can, yeah, I have a whole contact page of all my social media links and everything. So um, I, I prefer Facebook or email. Okay. But feel free to reach out, you know, Instagram, Twitter, like where, like I'm all over the place. Sure. Um, oddly enough, is I don't really promote my book that much on my website, except for a couple of places in my blog posts. I do have another site. I call it my author site. It's LorraineRegularly.com. And that's where I have, you know, like my books and my appearances, and, you know, okay. things like that that I've done. Um, but I... I, I do have some like cross linking, like from one, one site to the other. Right. 
um like when well, i'll make I sure i will i'll i'll do the I'll, research I'll, some, and I'll put it all in the in the show notes so anyone that's listening now if you whether you're listening on itunes or wherever it may be you could take a look at the show notes i'll put direct links to to all of uh, lorraine's websites as well as her social media as well so you could learn a little bit more um now i know you mentioned you, you've talked about poetry i'm sure there's some great quotes in there so one of the things i like to do at the end and again it's very hard to wrap it up in one little quick like you know billboard statement but if if there's something that you'd want to leave the audience with and whether it, again whether it's a quote a poem an idea a concept uh, for what you've been through now and you have a moment to reflect back on everything that happened since 14 and everything you just guided us through and, and where you are today and maybe there's someone that may, may not have the exact story and, and whatever it may be they they need some kind of inspiration to make that change or to find the hope that they need to, to succeed and, and follow their dreams. What do you have to, to, to say to, to leave them with that, that they might be able to take uh, one step forward starting today or tomorrow to, to make a positive change in their life? Okay, so there's three things that I want to mention. One, everything happens for a reason. We might not know what the reason is at the time, but everything happens for a reason. And I really believe that because I am now using my experience of being raped and going through you know, the drugs and the prostitution and all the negative shit in my life, turning into, into a positive because I was able to move past all that and, and to share my message, which brings me to point two of hope, is to, you have the power within yourself whether you think it or not right now, you have the power within yourself to make the changes that you want. And if you take one small step every day, that small step, all of those small steps added up will lead you forward to where you want to go. Now, you can start by using uh, positive affirmations because that will quickly change your mindset and give you the you know the desire to want to keep going on um and then the third thing is that there's you have to reach out to other people you can't do it alone like you need to build a support system and you can find those people online you can find them in your real life um if you belong to any any kind of you know i, I mean in, in real life it's a lot harder Online, it's it's so much easier because you can you know you can you have the the convenience of being behind a screen, so it's safer, and you can feel more comfortable with reaching out. It's much easier to you know type a quick text message to somebody online or post in a Facebook group you know that you join like for support or or something like that than it is to actually like face to face talk to somebody. So that might be a starting point as well is to reach out to somebody you know yourself you know what you're comfortable with and what you're not comfortable with so even you know try sticking to what you're comfortable with at first and then move out of your comfort zone as you gain your confidence and as you see like oh yeah you know what people are willing to help now i'm going to just end with something that my friend max Maxwell Ivy Jr. He's a three-time author. He's one of my clients. He's a best friend. Today's actually his birthday, so happy 53rd, Max. Um, he says, if you don't ask for, to, for help, if you don't ask people for help, you're actually robbing them of the chance to help you. And you're robbing them of those, those feelings. Like, you know how good it is when you feel, like when you help somebody, like how good you feel? He says, you're robbing them of that feeling. So if you kind of look at it that way, by asking for help, you're actually making someone feel better. Not just you, but someone else, because it gives them the chance to help you. He says it much better than I can say it, but that's the essential uh, idea. Right. So, so, you know, number one, everything happens for a reason. Number two, you have the power within yourself to change. And number three, ask for help reach out to somebody whether it's me eric someone else reach out so those are my three my three big messages 
I love it. And I, I mean, um, man, listening to your story and, you know, it just, it's, it's unbelievable to constantly hear from different people that I interview, how strong the human spirit really is, even from a point of it being so broken down. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's just, it's, it shows to me so much hope, um, that there's there's still so many we hear about a lot of negativity in the world and, and on the news all the time but there's so many of these wonderful stories of people that have been to hell and back like you said and have risen from the ashes and have made a life for themselves and even in situations where you almost lost connection with your son you were able to get that back oh, yeah. the end all be all is if a suicide attempt was was successful that's the end you 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 found an opportunity to survive Suicide that is a solution, a permanent solution to a temporary problem. Right. Dr. Phil said that, I right. believe. So don't make a permanent solution to your temporary problem. Right. Find a better solution. You get no matter how dark it is, and you'll never think that the pain will go away. And as they say, time heals all wounds. Doesn't mean you forget about it, but you'll be able to process it differently. And what you're upset about now, will you be upset about that a month, a year, two years from now, five years from now? If you think about all the fights that you've had with people, all the times you've been depressed in your life, you might reflect back and go, what did we even fight about there? What was I so upset about on that day? Well, that means you've recovered from that. You've gotten through that. You've gotten past that. So you, you have to allow, like you said, through these three steps, the opportunity for you to, to, to overcome it and get past it. And it will make you a better stronger person and again by you opening up your story and your vulnerability and being open and honest and transparent about what you went through and it can't be easy to even hear the words come out of your mouth even though it's the life that you lived to to confess it and to talk about it and to grow from it and to take that lemon and make some beautiful lemonade out of it uh you know good for you and it's it's inspiring to me again i'm a, i'm a father of of, of twin girls that are going to be 13 in september so okay. hearing what hearing what happened to you at 14 uh I felt it in my chest when you say that because I could I could imagine you know what, what that age girl is like and I've been teaching for a long time so I have students of that age mm -hmm. and I I can't imagine uh, what that experience has been like but I'm so thankful that you've been able to reach a point in your life where you're you're happy and even for anyone that watches this is also going to be available if you're listening there's a video version that will be on YouTube when uh, when it's released you could watch Lorraine's face change from her story of her youth to when she got into her business and getting her son back and your face shined and you yeah. smiled you smiled from ear to ear and that's who you are now and yeah, exactly. i just think you need to remind uh, 14 year old Lorraine that that she's okay that's all I would say to you. And if you have a chance to continue to spread that message to others, I think your potential of helping people is limitless. So you know what the problem is with these podcasts is I can't reach through the street to give you a great big hug right now. <laughs> <laughs> So it's a virtual thanks. hug for now, but listen, if, uh, if you're ever in the States, I'm in New Jersey. I have a, a, one of my best friends is in Ottawa. You know, I've been up to, to, to visit him as well. But if we, if our paths cross, uh, yes, I'd be sure. honored to meet you and, and to give you that hug and um, oh, it, 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 on your journey through your public speaking or anything, if there's any way um, that I could help support that, contribute to it, join you on stage one day, whatever I could ever do to contribute to, to spreading your word and your story, I'd, I'd be honored to do it. Thank you so much. So and, thank you so much. Go ahead. Uh, you know, thanks for reminding me about, you know, reaching out through through people in, in the high schools. That's really something that, you know, why I wanted to become a teacher in the first place is because I wanted to help those students because I know what I went through as a student. Mm -hmm. And after I quit teaching and moved back home, um, I, well, I, I was in an accident that I, I almost lost my leg. We didn't talk about that, but anyways. Um, so I was never able to physically return to teaching in a classroom. Um, because of climbing the stairs and, you know, standing for extended periods of time and things like that. Um, so it's nice. It was nice to be reminded of why I wanted to become a teacher in the first place. Mm -hmm. And I really need to revisit that and get back into the school, even if it is just to do, uh, a, you know, a one time like public presentation about, you know, my experiences and you know talking about my book and talking about what i went through and and letting these students know that someone out someone like me is out there ready to help them 
and so, you know who they can turn to if they feel like they don't have anyone else. So it's a very powerful story you have to share, and you have you have. You it's it's that. my pleasure. Listen, as a as a teacher myself, I volunteer a lot at the local high schools. They have uh, some self defense classes. I guess teach at. I do it for free, as I do with a, a variety of other programs. And it's because. If you have an opportunity to reach out and to help somebody and to, to like you said, robbing them the feeling, you obviously I get something from that as well, knowing that I've been able to contribute back and help someone and, and to be there to support them and connect with them. And sometimes these schools invite people in that are that are just famous, they're celebrities, they're sports athletes, but they're not public speakers. They don't right. know how to communicate. It's different when you can get in front of people and your your skill set is in communication. And when they could connect with you, like you said, when that record record scratch that day that you were sharing your story and everyone's jaws dropped and they were just zoned into what you had to say. Right. That's just a glimpse of what you still have to offer everybody, Lorraine. And again, it's it's not something I'm pushing upon you, but uh, you know, obviously as a as a as a martial arts teacher and as a coach, it's it's always kind of my job to kind of guide people in the right direction and, and see some potential within them. And I know deep down you know that 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 that's true. And that's something that you can and mm -hmm. should be doing. Mm -hmm. I'm not forcing it upon you and say you have to do it tomorrow. I think you have to come to peace with that and do it when you're ready. No, I. Uh, but I do not believe your. I, I, I don't believe your mission is your mission is complete yet. I believe that you have many people um, that you can continue to inspire and save. And if you decide to take that on, you know, good for you. And if you decide to put the focus in other areas, that that's that's okay also. But. I believe you have tremendous opportunity and potential and, and the openness to, to share your story. Uh, always imagine this. What if you existed to 14 year old Lorraine? What if, right. what if after what had happened to you, someone stepped in through that door and shared their story? Would you have maybe opened up what happened to you sooner? And then maybe where would your life have taken you? Who knows? So yeah. you, you have the potential to offer that to people. And, you know, this, this is a podcast that could be shared as, as a part to highlight, um, you know, your story as well. And to, to, to be a small glimpse and a small part of sharing your story, it's, uh, you know, it makes me feel very uh, honored and privileged that I, you know, decided to, to take this on to get to meet people like yourself that for, for not this uh, opportunity and venue of podcasting, I, we, we may, may have never met or had an opportunity to, to speak with each other. But like you said, everything happens for a reason. So we were, we were meant to talk to each other. Yes. And thank you so much for, you know, for talking to me and for, for being there to listen to me and help me through things that I didn't even realize until today that I still have to work through. Sure. You know, well, we always think like, Oh, when we get to the point where we're feeling so good about ourselves, we think, Oh yeah, you know, I'm, I'm good. I'm good to go. But you know, the healing process, that's the really funny thing about the healing process is it's, it is ongoing. Even though you think you have healed, there's still, there's still more to go. You know, there's still just that little bit extra. And, you know, that kind of makes life interesting because even though you might see as an, as a negative thing, it kind of reminds you of all the positives. And it, you know, it brings me back to like where I used to be, where I am now. And yeah, you know what? I shouldn't take my life now for granted because like there's still people out there that are going through struggles and I still need to help them. Mm -hmm. So my, you're right. My job isn't done. Right. It's, it's far from done. It is far from done. And I know that. I mean, like I said, I embrace this new role um, with open arms because I do like helping people. I just didn't realize of, I guess to the, the fullest extent to which I can help people mm -hmm. and the many different ways I can do it. So thank you for reminding me of that. Well, I'm, I'm honored. It's my, it's my pleasure. And thank you for spending your time again with me once again and, and, and coming on the, the podcast and, and without yeah, so it. ran over time. <laughs> no, there's no overtime. You know, like this is, I told you at the beginning, this is, uh, this is unscripted. If anyone's listening, I, I told Lorraine before I even hit record, I, I, I have no questions in front of me. This takes a life of its own. Um, and before you know it, you blink and you know, you're, you know, uh, an hour and 20 minutes or so into it. And, right. but it's okay because there, there's no, I can't put a time on sharing this conversation in this story because what I want, if anything, 
is to, the reason I don't have it scripted is I want people to know it's raw, it's organic, it's real. And mm -hmm. how many people, when you're going through the things in your life that are sitting next to you, you know, uh, you know, on the bus or you're at a store waiting for your oil to be changed that we just dismiss all these people that are around us or whatever moods they may be in and just judge them from afar, take a step back and wonder what, it, what they have going on in their life and maybe turn to them and see if they need some help and that the powerful words of, hey, are you okay, can go a long distance or turn to someone oh, to your side and just yeah. put your phone down for a second, stop texting or looking at your Facebook and just have a conversation with somebody and that's why I, I was so inspired. I'll just start, smile at you know? somebody. Exactly. Just, just, just smile at somebody. Get to know some people that are out there and, 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 and enjoy a conversation again. There's some amazing, amazing people in this world that are that are trying to get through life like we all are. And, you know, the more that we could be open and share with each other, I think uh, it makes for a, a much better place to live in. And so, oh, again, sure. without a doubt, 100%, you, you are a life's black belt. Now, does that mean that you're at the end? No. I told you before on the martial arts standpoint, I got my black belt in 1995 and I've been training and I still train since and I'm pursuing a second black belt in another style. I don't want to go off on a tangent, but it never, what I've learned though is that it's a lifelong process. There is no end. It's the consistent pursuit of perfection that I know that I'll never reach, but I will constantly strive for every single day. And, and that's why that to me is a mirror of what you continue to do in your life and 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 I wish you nothing but the continued success in that pursuit. And I look forward to hearing more stories and following you online and seeing where your where your path takes you next. So, uh, once again, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for listening to uh, to Lorraine's story. Check out the show notes as well. I will have the links to all of her websites and social media. Please pick up a copy of her book at Amazon. Uh, follow her on social media, and if you're going through any sort of struggles or you need any insight or advice at all, as Lorraine said, she's available. Uh, find her on Facebook, shoot her an email. I think she would be happy to, to be able to reach out and to help you. And uh, Lorraine, thank you so much and um, best of luck with everything that you pursue going forward. Thank you. I appreciate everything.